I want to introduce Mickey Vale to the stage. Hello, hello. Yeah. Can y'all hear me okay? Thank you. Can we get a little soul, soul clap popping? Yeah. Uh, nice, thank you. Uh, effortless, black excellence. Effortless, we on some epic shit. Effortless, black excellence. Effortless, we on some epic shit. Uh, I'm attracted to the humble and the hustling, the ones who hold weight and ain't afraid to put some muscle in. Black diamonds, shining like custom rims, building pyramids, hair wrapped in fine muslin. Comedic, black and unapologetic. Get it, anybody, cause anybody can get it, huh? Get it? A whole nother pedigree. Your chick going loco over these local celebrities. All right, all right. All right. Thank you. Um, I am Mickey Vale. I'm a hip hop artist, among other things. Um, as Ramel so wonderfully said, I'm a playwright, I'm a teaching artist. Um, what else do I do? I DJ, if you need me to. Um, but primarily, my career up to, we could say now, has been rooted in hip hop. Hip hop artist, what does that mean? So I rap, as you saw. Um, like I said, I can DJ if you need me to. I perform. It means that people offer me opportunities to perform for um, exposure. <laughs> or for weed. Because <laughs> that's all you need when you're a local hip-hop artist, weed and exposure. So, um, <laughs> it is very laughable. Um, so, that, that verse that you just heard, that was from a song called Epic. Oh, that's my job. Epic, verse one. We're, we're all making a song together right now. Verse one is epic. Um, so I am in a group with a friend and longtime collaborator. Her name is Queen Candy Cole. And yeah, Queen Candy Cole, woo -hoo. Um, And we are in a group together called 50-50. In 2016, we made a song and we called it Epic. We decided to title it Epic. And that was a verse from that song, that, the verse that you just heard. Um, so we needed the name Epic to be Epic. So we decided to make it into an acronym. And we were trying to decide what, what do the letters E-P-I-C stand for? What Epic name do these stand for? And I am, I'm an old school hip hop head. I grew up in the 80s and 90s. I love old school hip hop. So back then, hip hop was fun. It was, you know, all this random stuff like, like Dwick, Gangstar, like D W Y C K. Nobody knew what Dwick stood for, but it was fun and we loved it. Lemonade is a popular drink and it still is. Like very random. So in my, my nostalgia, I reached into my nostalgia bag and I was like, okay, let's do something fun and, and old school hip hop. -y. So I was thinking eating pizza in Cairo. <laughs> Makes sense, right? <laughs> and so Candy was like, what does it mean? And I'm like, nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. It's great, right? Genius. And so she thought about it. She's like, maybe. We could, maybe. OK, we'll consider it. We thought, thought some more. And then we ended up landing on every piece is connected. And piece being a play on, on words. So, we ended up landing on every piece is connected, but low key between me and Candy, it was AKA eating pizza in Cairo. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me give you a little backstory. In 2016, I went through a breakup. I was very sad, I was very heartbroken. Anybody ever experienced heartbreak? Yeah. Eee, yeah, so you feel me? It's hard to get out of bed every day, it's, it's rough. So I was going through that and I talked to a friend and um, she, eating pizza in Cairo, she, <laughs> a very close friend of mine, she said, she asked how I was doing. And um, thanks to the magic of the internet, I happened to know that my ex was going on a trip to Cuba. And I was like, she's going to Cuba. She's moved on already, she probably got a boo, she's going on a trip across the world with the boo. Uh, um, 
And so my friend was like, so what? You're going to Africa. And I was like, OK. Africa was not on my radar. I don't know where she got that from. But it sounded cool. And she was like, yeah, you're going to Africa. No big deal. And I was like, cool. I'm going to Africa. Yeah, I'm going to Africa. How am I getting to Africa? <laughs> because weed and exposure don't <laughs> add up to trips to Africa. <laughs> um, so she, my friend is very good with managing money and budgeting. And she said, you start a, a savings account and just keep adding to that account. Call it your motherland money. And I'm like, OK, yeah. All right, so I started, I started an account. My motherland monies. <laughs> So I got my motherland monies, I'm, I'm putting it in that account, and I start looking for opportunities to go to Africa, because I am going to Africa. Um, I had a lot of friends who are educators, and one of my friends, she takes her students to, um, they, take, they do group tours to Africa every other year. So I checked in with her, asked her if they were going to Africa that year, and she said funding was a little funny, she wasn't sure if they were going, but she would let me know. So I'm like, okay, cool. So I'm looking out for all these different opportunities to go to Africa. I'm looking into group tours. I found out it would probably be about three to $4,000 to go. So I'm like, OK, I got a goal. Stack up for $4,000. Um, a little more backstory. So I wrote this in my passion planner. Because I was going to Africa, and you know, like the great prophet Erica Badu says, if you write it down, you make it real. So I wrote it down to make it real. Hopefully, you can read that. OK, cool. Um, I was in a hurry that day. <laughs> I usually write much nicer than that. But um, so I wrote it down to make it real. A little more backstory, because like I said, every piece is connected. A year prior to this, I had applied to go to um, a hip hop exchange program for this hip hop exchange project, program called Next Level that sends hip hop artists to different parts of the world to work with um, youth and do hip hop workshops in those countries. So I had applied the year before. For some strange reason, I didn't get accepted. Crazy. Um, but because I was so determined to do this, because when I saw the opportunity, I was like, this is all me. Y'all not gonna, you're not gonna forget about me. So I applied again. And this time, I was accepted. So thank you. Thank you. So um, and this was right after I got accepted right after my friend told me I was going to Africa. So the program reaches out, and they tell me what countries they're going to that year, five, five countries. And they asked me to pick two, my top two. They said, you may not get to go to um, where you choose, but just let us know your top two. Two of the countries that they were going to that year or on the continent of Africa, Morocco and Egypt. I picked Morocco and Egypt, and I got selected for Egypt. So that's this. I just found out I'll be teaching the art of emceeing in Egypt. Thank you, hip hop. Thank you, hip hop. <laughs> um, and that's me in Egypt. I'm on a camel. So within months of my friend telling me that I was going to go to Africa, to me, it seemed like the most random thing, but I was all for it. I was in Africa, and not only was I there, I didn't have to pay, I, I, I got paid to go. And to do this beautiful work that was an extension of the work that I had been doing my whole life. So write it down, make it real. Um, verse two, kismet. Oh, uh, by the way, I, when I got to, we were in, um, we were in Alexandria, Egypt, and we spent two weeks in Alexandria, Egypt, and one week in Cairo. So before I left the airport, when I was leaving Cairo, I went and got a slice of pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and I ate pizza in Cairo. <laughs> um, so Kismet, what is it? As Ramel said, it's fate, it's destiny. And when I was thinking about this, when, when he approached me about doing this, uh, I thought, well, yeah, my whole life is kismet. Kismet, is that how you say it? Kismet. Um, my whole life is kismet, so much so that my friends and I, we say, instead of manifesting, we say Mickey-festing. Because <laughs> a 
Like it's really a thing. We say Mickey Feste. And so I thought about how, the way that Kismet shows up in my life. And most of it, when I thought about it, it was attached to times when I showed up, showing up. And I was thinking, does, does Kismet happen to us? Does fate happen to us? Or do we create it? And I think, I think it's a little of both. But we have to put the ball in motion to, to make it happen. So um, yeah, just every time that I, I showed up, and many times I did not want to show up. There's so many times I didn't want to show up. But every time I show up, something amazing happens. And after a while, it's like, OK, I'm making the connection. When I do show up, there's some opportunity. I meet someone amazing. Um, I have a great conversation. I make a, a great connection. And so showing up just opens the door to these great opportunities. And it doesn't, have, it doesn't even have to be physically showing up. Like putting in that application for the hip hop exchange program, that was showing up. I was showing up for this opportunity before I even knew what I was doing. You know, I didn't know I was showing up for it. Putting it, like a lot of people don't want to fill out grant applications. I know I don't. But when you do that, you're putting that, that in motion. If you don't do it, you're not going to get it, period, right? And a lot of people aren't. That's one thing I've learned, too. A lot of people aren't going to fill out the application. So your chances are great, because they're not, they're not going to, they don't want to do it. So, so do it. If there's anything, any deadlines coming up, make sure you put in those applications. But um, yeah, so Kismet for me is showing it. And This is just follow the path of your heartbeats. This is just something that I came up with a while back because I was thinking, you know, I, I'm an artist. I'm kind of all over the place. Um, like I said, weed and exposure. I'm not always the most stable financially. Uh, when I am, it's great. When I'm not, I'm still, I'm, I'm still doing the art, doing the things that I love. So sometimes, you know, it's like, should I have followed the beaten path? Nah, I like this path. This is the path my heart beats. So follow the path your heart beats. That's something that I live by. Um, purpose. First three, purpose. What is purpose? Purpose is the why, the reason. Why do I do this? Um, I think for me, purpose has been everything that I've, I've done Every time kismet showed up in my life, or these, these magical moments showed up, it was rooted in purpose. That trip to Egypt was, was part of my purpose. I've been making hip hop all my life. I've been creating and writing all my life. That was just a, an extension of this purpose that I have in the world. So um, that's me doing my purpose at um, Black Women Black Women's March, San Diego Black Women's March, shout out to Kelsey. Um, but when I was 39 years old, I turned 39. Anybody been 39? <laughs> 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 On my 39th birthday, that, is it just me or is 39 like, whoa? <laughs> oh, shit. My 30s are behind me, 40s knocking at my door like, hey. <laughs> um, 39. That birthday messed me up. I woke up and I was like, oh my god. What have I done with my life? <laughs> I performed at every venue in San Diego. I felt like I was spinning my wheels. I'm out here performing. They're paying me a weed. <laughs> oh, I can't go on like this. And I don't even smoke. <laughs> so I just really realized that I'm not, I'm not operating in my purpose right now. And so my wish for myself, my birthday wish for myself was for everything a year from now before I turn 40. I want everything to be different. I, this is not it. This ain't it. Um, so be careful what you wish for. <laughs> that year was transformative. A lot of things changed in that year. That relationship that I spoke out that was almost a decade long, that ended. Um, I didn't see that coming. Um, but so some of the things that happened were welcome changes, and some were very painful. But I realized that all of those things needed to happen in order for me to get to where I needed to be in the next, the next level. So um, 
I made that decision and I feel like everything worked in my favor to get me to where I need to go. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. My bad. You weren't supposed to see that. <laughs> that was private. <laughs> um, so I have done a lot of work with the Old Globe Theater. Anyone heard of the Old Globe? Over there in Balboa Park. The Old Globe is not necessarily known for hip hop. Surprise, surprise. So how does a hip hop artist end up working with the Old Globe? So talking, speaking of showing up, um, one day I was DJing in, uh, well I was invited to DJ an event at, um, in Balboa Park. And at this point, this was kind of at the point where I felt like I was spinning my wheels and I, I didn't want to keep doing the same things I had been doing. So they asked me to DJ and I wasn't 100% in. Um, so, and I knew another DJ, it was a, a, they wanted a lot of Latin music and Latin art, female artists. And I didn't really have a huge catalog of Latin artists. And I honestly didn't feel like looking up a lot of things. So I knew another artist, a, another DJ who I knew that was her specialty and she would be great for it. So I suggested this other DJ. And the promoter said, thank you, I appreciate it, but we would really like to have you. We'd be on honored to have you. I'm like, honored? <laughs> <laughs> Since you put it that way, okay. So I went, I DJed the event, and as usual, I showed up and had a great time, and it was the best thing ever. Um, before I left that day, a woman came and she handed me her card. She said she worked at the Old Globe. Her name is Karen Ann Daniels. Wonderful woman, but I didn't know that at the time. I just knew that she was someone that worked at the Old Globe. And she asked if I would want to DJ an event coming up. And I was like, cool, maybe. And she said, it's Shakespeare's birthday party. <laughs> I'm like, okay, let's talk more about it. Because I'm not really, I don't know a lot about Shakespeare and I've never DJed a, a party for you know, Shakespeare. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, maybe. So we talked about it later and I ended up doing it. And it was fun, it was so fun. Everything's always fun. Everything I'm a little apprehensive about, they always tend, end up being really fun. Um, so I did that. Everybody did their sonnets, I dropped some beats, it was cool. If you get a chance to go to um, Shakespeare's birthday party in Balboa Park, go. It's, it's actually really fun. So um, I did that a, few, a couple months later, Karen Ann called me back and she asked if I would like to DJ a tour that they had coming up. And it was called Globe for All. It's a tour that they do every year. It's a six week tour. And she said, you would be our DJ. We would just need you to, that whole six, six weeks, you belong to us. You're gonna be working hard during that time. And I was like, cool, I can do that. Cause that sounds fun and different. So I did that. And I had never worked in theater before. I didn't know what I was showing up for. And when you say DJ, I thought, okay, I'm gonna come play some music and that's it. But I got to rehearsal the first day and I, I brought my little turntable. I had one turntable, one of my turntables was broken. So I taught myself how to DJ on one turntable. So I got my turntable, I'm sitting next to the director, Patricia McGregor, who at the time I didn't know was one of the most sought after directors in theater. All I know is I'm here to DJ. I'm gonna play some music. Um, Patricia, is asking me to play sounds. Like, can you, you know, at this part, can you play a little um, ambient sound? And I'm like, hmm. So she keeps doing this and I'm like, when is she gonna want me to, you know, play some beats, like drop some beats when, when I'm gonna play some music? And then I realized, someone came later to me and asked me how long I had been doing sound design. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. They call DJing sound design here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, I've been sound designing for a while. But <laughs> as time went on, I realized that sound design is an actual career. And so now I'm wearing a sound design hat because I said yes. So that was cool. So now I'm, I'm doing sound design and DJing, playing music, and just adding to my, my, my repertoire. And I loved, the thing I loved about that experience was I went to a meet and greet that they had. They had these meet and greets before the tour starts. And um, the artistic director at the Globe, Barry, Barry Edelstein, shout out to the Edelsteins, <laughs> Stacy Edelstein, 
<laughs> no relation, but they got the same name. <laughs> um, uh, what was I saying? Oh, he, he did the, his, the speech, and he talked about how the old globe is rooted in this community, but their patrons don't look like the community. And he wanted to change that. And that, that really resonated with me. This, this was before 2020, before people realized that Black Lives Matter. This was you know, years <laughs> before that. So that really, I was like, that's cool. That's a, a level of accountability I haven't seen. So it made me really want to be involved with the Old Globe. So I kept showing up. They call me for things, I show up. Keep showing up, showing up over and over again. And it just led to all these amazing opportunities, just um, writing plays, a commission to write a play. I started Soul Kiss Theater. And all these things were not things that I, I had on my, my, you know, my trajectory. I didn't see these things. But because I kept showing up, the world just kept opening up to me. And so I got called back for another tour, Karen Ann. At the end of the tour, she asked me if I was interested in being a teaching artist. And I was like, I don't know much about theater. I don't know if I'm the right person for that. And she said that we'll give you the tools that you need and we'll train you, but we'd really like to have you. I was like, cool, I can do that. If you're going to train me, OK. So when the position opened, I applied. I got hired as a teaching artist. I'm so excited because I adore Karen Ann. She brought me into something. She opened my world up to something that I, I'd never imagined. So I'm like, yes, I get to work with Karen Ann. Cool. So I go to orientation, and I learn at orientation that Karen Ann is leaving the company. And I'm like, man, why? Why? I go, we were just about to start working together, Karen Ann. So there's a, a going away party for Karen Ann. And Karen Ann is leaving. I'm all sad. Little did I know the person who was coming in to take over Karen Ann's job would be someone who would be very, very important in my life. I didn't know that at the time. But um, one door closed, another door opened. I met my partner, Laura, who's here. And that's a picture you weren't supposed to see earlier. <laughs> that's us. <laughs> so a lot of beautiful things. Like, I, I never saw it coming, but I believe it's all kismet, all of it, by just showing up and being open to these opportunities and, and letting, letting life, let, letting these magical moments happen to you. Um, do I have anything else? That's a quote that I love and I live by. Um, so what I'd like you to do is Take a moment to think about what's your trip to Africa? What is that for you? What is something that you dare to put into motion? Where do you want to eat pizza next? Um, can I get another soul clap? I'm on my Cali grind, patient and virtuous. It's just a matter of time, time slipping away, no time to play. No matter what time zone or time of day. Uh, to get mine, I'ma find a way. I'm trying to be tucked away in a quaint little hideaway. Long before the day, I'm tired and gray. Settle down with some kids and some privacy. Chilling on my 40 acres, feed my mules, using tools of the trade to stay paid in full. I'm trying to touch a dream that's unattainable. Friends and fam, like damn, honey, what you waiting for? I'm on the threshold, ready to jump. Pistol grip in my lap, and I'm ready to pump, ready to dump this hot shit up in your ear and kick a little something for the world to hear. Yeah. That's all I got.